This is the Military Bottom Line Podcast, episode 85. Yeah, it, it's actually one of, in my opinion, and no, bias aside, uh, sure. one of the, the greatest opportunities a junior enlisted uh, can pursue. Welcome to the Military Bottom Line Podcast, where we learn from veterans and those currently serving how to make the most out of a military contract. We're here to motivate, inspire, and help you leverage your service to positively impact you professionally, personally, and financially during your military career and beyond. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Military Bottom Line Podcast. This is your host, Jason Birds. If you guys are still some of the ones that that um, listen to this show as I put them out sporadically at this point, I apologize for that um but i'm just like super grateful that you guys are are still tuning in and that you're patient enough to wait for the episodes despite them not coming out on a weekly basis anymore Uh, at some point i'm gonna have to give you guys all a kind of an update on things because uh i started this podcast like two years ago now i was going strong on the one time one interview a week um program and it was growing a lot and i was super grateful for everybody tuning in um, and then, um, obviously I'm not doing it on a weekly basis anymore, but doing it when I can connecting, uh, with guests when I can and bringing you their stories, which hopefully provide some value. And you learn about an opportunity that you didn't know existed and an opportunity that you can, uh, recreate for yourself and take advantage of like today, for instance, Bill Gurek was in the Navy as an enlisted it guy. And uh, within his first contract, he went from enlisted in the Navy to actually go into the U S Naval Academy where he finished his college degree, despite a lot of hurdles and struggle. Um, but I didn't even know that that route existed from going from active duty into the Academy. And so he shares a lot of information about that, um, shares about his experience in flight school and ultimately actually not making it in flight school and just kind of what resulted as, um, taking on that, that really, really disappointing, um, I don't, you know, it sounds rough to call it failure, but just not being able to hack it in the academic sector sector of flight school. Uh, so I definitely empathized with him on that a lot. And so I really hope you guys, you know, one hear about his story, gain some knowledge on his route, his experience, and hopefully, if you're, you know, young, enlisted, or thinking about joining, uh, you realize that the academy is still an option even after you've enlisted. But it does have an age cap. So you have to keep that in mind. But anyways, enough about me. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Welcome to the show, Bill. How you doing, man? Doing great, Jason. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. I I said prior to the uh, to the introduction here that I I appreciate your mustache and I can never grow one like that. So I'm I'm admiring. (laughs) Well, it's certainly a work in progress, and uh, yeah, it's it like like I said, it was a joke at first, and now it's become a thing. So I, I guess I'll rock it until uh, it drives me crazy. <laughs> right on, right on. So we uh, we connected just like recently via the war room, uh, which is kind of military millionaire, David Perez group mastermind. Uh, and I kind of got a, a snapshot of your story. And what particularly stuck out to me was, you know, you were on this this path to, you know, commissioning and flying in the Navy, uh, and that getting you know, unfortunately disrupted and, and kind of all of a sudden throwing you on a different path. So, you know, I know we can relate there, but before we get to kind of what you're doing now, I'd love to kind of hear, you know, bring us up to speed and, you know, where you're from, why you joined the military in the first place and, and kind of catch us up. Yeah, sure. Um, so really in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the Navy is a family business, a great family business. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm third generation Navy. Uh, my grandfather started in 1948, uh, flew for the Blue Angels in 1954 to 56, uh, became a two-star admiral, uh, commanded the the USS Kennedy, uh, the conventional version. Uh, right before he retired in 84, my dad joined the Naval Academy, um, had a great career flying in prowlers, and then became a public affairs officer, did uh, 27 years in the Navy. And uh, right after, or as he was gearing up to retire, uh, my younger brother and I got picked up to 
uh, go to the academy and, and commission. So we've had continue the Garrick household has had continuous naval service, uh, active duty service since 1948. No and so, wow. wow. So continuous I almost naval service and aviation service. So that even goes deep too. Yeah. Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, I kind of broke the mold a little bit, right? Um, sure. So I, I attempted, uh, but didn't wasn't successful in in getting my wings. But it it, it worked out uh, because I became a supply officer. But really, when I was in high school, um, I didn't want to join the navy, navy or the military in general. Um, uh, going through high school. Uh, I was really big into doing videos and stuff like that. I wanted to become a movie director. And so, of course, I, I did did the part, looked the part, all that good stuff. Uh, and then come to find out, you know, it's a really doggy dog world. Um, <laughs> and, of course, applying to any college, uh, I, really, I wasn't good to get into any, any colleges because I was just, mm-hmm. I was a jack off in high school because uh, yeah. I was making videos. And so I wasn't applying myself in, in high school. And so yeah. my dad pretty much came around and said, well, look at 18, you're going to get out of the house and you can either join the Navy or the military, uh, or you can go figure it out on your own. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll love you. We'll take care of you, but you're not going to live in this house. And so I decided to enlist in the Navy in 2006 and, uh, it really worked out. I, I, I was going to come in as a, um, an MC. So a, uh, kind of like a public affairs officer for enlisted okay. um, mass, uh, uh, media communications. Right. Uh, yeah. I might have that a little bit wrong for the rate, but uh, uh, kind of do that, you know, making stories, writing stories, but come to find out, I, I actually wasn't that great at English. Um, so they were like, <laughs> no, you can't do it. Your ASVAB score sucks, uh, but you could become an IT because you have the proficiency to do that. Okay. So became an IT uh, went off to boot camp, a school, uh, got picked up on the USS O'Kane. So it's a destroyer out of Honolulu, Hawaii. Nice. Phenomenal tour. Yeah, uh, I recommend bet. anyone go to Hawaii. Uh, so I, I'm curious, so you went from like not even thinking about the military to kind of being, you know, nudged in the direction, like you're on your own and you got to do something. Did once you started realizing like, okay, maybe I have kind of have to join the military. Did you, did those Navy roots kind of just take over and you're like, I might as well go Navy because that's what everybody else did? Or how did you choose Navy? Oh, that was just it. Right. right. So okay. I, I, I kind of looked at doing the Air Force because I love aircraft. I love airplanes. Um, yeah. The Army was not even a consideration on my part. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> and no offense, no offense to the Army guys. No offense to the Army. I love them. Uh, I, I love the Army guys. I got a bunch of neighbors around here that are Army, but. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do it. Right. Like crapping in a bucket, sleeping in a foxhole, mm-hmm. not, not my flavor. Right. So, sure. um, but, uh, yeah, I joined the Navy cause it was, it just made the most sense. Right. Like yeah. I said, it's a family business. Uh, I think I would have disappointed a lot of people mm-hmm. if I had joined a different branch. Um, and, and the other thing too, I meant to mention, I mean, it's my, uh, extended family. So like my grandfather on my mom's side of the house, um, he was in the Marine Corps as a musician. Uh, both three of my great uncles uh, were in the invasion of Normandy. Okay. So again, it's like having that tie to the Navy. Yeah. Uh, r- really, there's there's no one else on both sides of the family who who serve in any other branch. So wow, wow. Fair so it's a pretty easy choice. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Yeah, well, it's nice to have easy choices sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yes. you ended up in Hawaii and you're in IT and you're just kind of making it up as you go. No no real long-term like goals or aspirations of a full-on Navy career, right? No, not at all. Um, so I joined the Navy to kind of get that maturity. Yeah. Uh, at the time, my dad also sold me the the pitch on the, the GI Bill. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... I. I had I had enlisted in the Navy with a four year contract um, with the inclusion of extra college money mm-hmm. in in conjunction with the GI Bill, right? So when you sign on, you can either get a sign on bonus or you can get uh, money that goes towards college. I think at the time it was like twenty or thirty thousand dollars extra. Um, a GI Bill kicker. It was a GI Bill kicker. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is now. Uh, 
you know, it, it was like that back yeah, close to 17 years ago. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure it hasn't changed because it seems like a pretty good program. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, I got that with the intent to only serve for four years um, and, and go out and just kind of do my own thing uh, in, in the college world. Uh, however, I had met my ship on deployment, did the deployment thing, rapidly matured, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, we were, we were serving in the, um, in, uh, fifth fleet. So if, if people don't know what fifth fleet is, it's the Persian Gulf, right? So stopped in places like Bar- Bahrain, Dubai, uh, during that time, uh, the Iranians will still, were still doing a lot of crazy stuff. So had a lot of interaction with Iranians and so kind of grew from there uh, a lot right. of scary moments um but you know learn from that and then when i got done with deployment i think that light bulb finally came on that said hey I- i'm ready to go to college now like i'm ready mm. to do this um and so i was already looking at colleges and looking how to do that and my dad then recommended hey have you considered the naval academy um and I, I didn't think about it. And a lot of my friends were like, you're crazy. Why would yeah. you ever subject yourself to that? Because everyone knows, <laughs> right? You get, it's essentially a, a school slash prison, um, yeah. to put it bluntly. Um, well, but, it's, it's also just not a, it's not a common path. You know, like you should sure you got like MESEP and ECP and these things where you can go from officer or rather from enlisted to officer, but it's not a common path to go from enlisted to an academy to officer. It's usually you know, a traditional school or, you know, school while you're actively full-time serving. Um, and like, yeah. So, I mean, just to even think about that, that route, there aren't too many mentors where you can go talk to like, yeah, I, I did exactly this. Um, and I honestly, I didn't even know, I, I guess it sh- should be clear and obvious that it can be done, but, um, I didn't really know it was a, a, a path that you could take. Yeah. It, it's actually one of, in my opinion, and no, by a side, uh, sure. one of the, the greatest opportunities a junior enlisted uh, can pursue. Yeah. Um, part of part of what kind of closes a lot of people down is you're giving up a lot, right? When you become mm-hmm. enlisted, sure you're you're, you're kind of um, you know young, and people don't really treat you with a, a tremendous amount of yeah. responsibility or or expectations, right? But mm-hmm. um, you're an adult. You're treated like an adult, and um, going to the academy, you kind of give that up and you to become a midship and you're you're totally. like an underclassman, you know, plebe year sucks. Everyone who knows plebe year, they're they're just get they're your freshman year, right? Yeah. You're just getting pummeled and you're learning things like physics and chemistry at the same time. So mm-hmm. imagine doing boot camp, but you're also getting a bachelor's of science. Yeah. Um yeah. And so people don't particularly want to subject themselves to that. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, you've already kind of knocked yourself to the bottom by, you know, starting off as an E1. And then you're like, you know, finally, maybe you made it to like E3, things are a little bit better. You're like, do I really want to go backwards, you know, like for four years? Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow. Not to mention right. the work, you know. Right. And so I, I had I had actually done that, right? So when I enlisted, I started out as an E1. Uh, and by the time I got picked up for the Naval Academy, um, I got selected for the Naval Academy prep school. So NAPS, okay. uh, I actually a- applied for it because I wanted that, that jump start into getting back into academics. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's in Newport, Rhode Island. It's a one year stint, um, right there in, in beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. I love it. Sure. Uh, it only has like three months out of the year that sucks because of the, the, the winter cold, but, yep. uh, Newport's phenomenal. So I went there for a year. So uh, I, 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 before we get too far in this, because I want to, I want to kind of paint this picture on like how you actually take advantage of this route. Because one, you yeah. said that you were kind of a not a great high school student, so you don't have a good high school background. That is usually what people use to get into the academy. M- maybe some good referrals or something like that. But it sounds like you, you know you're super average. No offense, just super average. Like yeah. you join the navy, like not really know what you're doing, and all of a sudden you're on this like, this route to go to the naval academy which is obviously yeah, that, prestigious and difficult to obtain. So how did that even work? Yeah. So really that that's just it, right? Um, if you apply to the Enable Academy as a high schooler, you need to be top 1% of your class in high school to even be remotely competitive, right? Because every year, I think the numbers keep growing, but 
it, I think every year it's somewhere around 10 to 15,000 applicants. And of course the class size is uh, about a thousand people. Mm. Um, and, and so, and there is a slice that's made out solely for active duty members who are coming in. So there, there is a quota. And again, I'm sure somebody at the board of admissions will see this and be like, that guy's lying. But yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> really the, there's a, there's a portion that's sliced out that is reserved for active duty members. Um, and so if you're applying as a, a high school kid, it's, I mean, you have to be a really good varsity athlete. Um, and you have to be, you have to have incredible standardized test scores and you generally have to have almost a four Oh, um, mm. for enlisted members who want to apply, um, that, that competition is kind of pushed off to the side. You still have to compete, right? You still have to actually perform and meet the standards, uh, but not nearly in the same way as a top performing high school student. Mm. Um, so I got it. Yeah. I, I suck at tests. Uh, so I had to take the ACT like five times by the time okay. I got accepted, it was like a 23, right? So nothing, nothing groundbreaking. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my grades from high school didn't reflect, but my track record in the service. So I had perfect evals. I got qualified really quickly. I had endorsements from my division officer and my captain on the ship. Um, so that's where you kind of play that game to get in to the academy. Okay. Um, and so it's a tremendous opportunity for someone who joins the Navy or, or even, I mean, anyone can apply, even an yeah. army member can apply to the Naval Academy. Okay. Right. Um, it, and then go it gives back to the army or then they have to sign a Navy commission. And contract. No. So, uh, when you go to the Naval Academy, generally you're on track to, to serve okay. in the Navy. Yeah. Um, or Marine Corps. Yeah. Or the Marine Corps, right? Yeah. Occasionally, there are opportunities where there can be a, a, a jump, but that might gotcha. be a little too advanced sure, for, sure, uh, sure. <laughs> for what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a phenomenal opportunity. I've actually tried to help. Uh, I've only got one sailor in because uh, it is it is challenging for a sailor because um, they have to they have to put in the time to get at least decent standardized test scores. You know, yeah. they don't have to get a perfect score, but they have to get a decent one, and they also have to put in the time to do the personal statements, the endorsements, um, they have to do, uh, what's called a, um, a, uh, it's like a CFA candidate fitness assessment. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a PRT, right? So a, a physical readiness test, okay. it's kind of like a PRT, uh, but there's a little more to it, um, just to make sure that you're, you're you, you know, you have, it's, it's, and it's not easy. Um, so the process is a little bit difficult, but, um, those who actually put in the time uh, usually get it, can get accepted. Um, yeah. And, and, I, and I, I felt that, that, I mean, you know, there's always going to be like, they, they have to make the application process difficult to get rid of the really lazy ones, you know, like the ones that aren't even going to show up to, to put in an application. So I right. think those that are, they think it's a, it sounds like a good route and that aren't turned off by the application process. Like your, your chances just got that much higher by just doing the work, you know? Um, right. So I, yeah, don't let, you know, I don't want anybody to be discouraged that just because it's a difficult application, like getting over that hump is a significant achievement and is only going to get you that much closer. So yeah, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, even the application process. So a lot of sailors who come to me, who know my background and, and want to talk to me about it. Um, and they're like, I want to go to the Naval Academy. Part of my little test is I, I say, well, I'm going to help you, but a lot of it has to be driven by you because the moment you get accepted, I'm not going to be around any month longer. I'll be a phone call away, but you got to like part of the application process is that, that test to make sure that when you finally get accepted and you're just getting your ass beat, mm -hmm. uh, that you actually have the determination to keep charging through it. Cause yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, when I went through, uh, I actually wanted to quit twice. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, by the grace of God, I had my brother there and I had good friends. Um, and, uh, my brother pushed me along mm -hmm. I mean, my brother's a, a total whiz. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's super smart. So he, he was, he was doing just fine. I was suffering. Uh, you know, I think I graduated from with a, with, a, with like a two, five, two, six GPA. And, and there were a lot of moments where I was just like, Oh my gosh, man, I'm just, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Um, but having that 
determination, that push, you know, I did follow through and make through. And looking back on it, I mean, it, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me because, you know, I, I didn't have to owe college debt. Yeah. Um, the alumni is phenomenal. So internally, I mean, like, what is driving you? You know, yeah, you got your brother, you got friends there pushing you, but like internally, if you're, yeah, you, you didn't really plan on a Navy career. You, you, at this point, you haven't mentioned any hopes and dreams of flying. Like you're just kind of like almost fell into it, you know? And so that's super easy to quit from if you don't have some long distant aspiration that's pushing you. So when things get crappy and difficult, I mean, what made you stick it out internally in your head? So my first two years I was there, I actually had no ambition to become a pilot. Um, I be I wanted to follow the IT route and yeah. uh, and and become a uh, IP. So it's an information professional. It's it's like a officer equivalent of an IT, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I took a semester of computer programming. And I found out my brain's not wired up to do that. Mm. I mean, my brain could not program to save my life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even the yeah. simple hello world, right? Script, uh, not good, not good. And yeah. so I I essentially flunked out of that. And I said, wow, I, you know, th- this ain't working out. Um, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Uh, but I kicked into economics. So I went into the economics uh, department. And I got a degree in economics. And so I, I loved learning about money and how the world worked. And that was, at that time, too, while I was making that transition, um, I selected pilot because I was like, mm. I want to go fly. I can have this opportunity because a, a lot of there are a lot of folks who go to the academy solely to become pilots. Right. Yeah. Because if you know, it, it, it is the most prestigious route to go yeah. to the academy and then go off to flight school and fly for the Navy or the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, and so I, I picked to do pilot and for my junior and senior year, uh, I, I pushed really hard to learn as, you know, as much as I could and, and be competitive enough to go off to flight, well, to get selected for Navy pilot and go off to flight school. And so again, I, I, I did, and I, I went after graduation. Um, were you surprised by that? Like that you did get selected for pilot? I actually was. Yeah, I, to be honest with you, I was um, because, like I said, my my GPA wasn't all that great. Yeah. However, I got involved. I got involved with a lot of programs that um, kind of pushed me into that department. So when I was going through NAPS, um, I got as close to a check ride of getting my pilot license. So mm-hmm. I, I got all the way up to the part where you get your final check ride cool. and you get your pilot license. But I couldn't just because of time, and also I ran out of money. Um, Wait, and wait, so wait. You, the the navy wasn't paying for that when you're doing it? No, the the navy the navy's funny when it comes to uh uh flight training, right? So I've I've even looked at continually getting certifications using the GI bill. Um yeah. and there's a couple little I think at one point they did have it to where you you could full and open use G- GI bill, but now if if you went off to like if I wanted to get my instrument rating or commercial rating you have to bring the money up front, pay for the training, and then they compensate you. There's super nuanced ways, yeah, with the GI Bill. Like it has to be part of your degree plan. Like you can't just go to school to get you all these ratings. You have to go to school for like pilot sciences, which happens to include these ratings, you know, to get yeah. your bachelor's degree. So yeah, there's a bunch of hoops to jump through. Yeah. Yeah. So uh so because I had experience in those fields and a lot of people were looking out for me you know i I networked uh got to know a lot of guys who were on the aviation selection board at the academy um and so it it really helped me out they threw me a bone um Mm -hmm. which is kind of the regret i had when i watched out of flight school Mm -hmm. because it was like i let those people down and honestly circling back to your question about what pushed me through the naval academy was just that it was always about you know, I didn't want to disappoint my family. I certainly didn't want to disappoint myself, but more so I didn't want to disappoint my family and also mm-hmm. also that missed opportunity, right? So um, that's kind of the motivator. That's kind of what pushed me through mm-hmm. uh, all those hard times. It was like, I didn't want to disappoint and I didn't want to miss out on that opportunity. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's, yeah, I mean, the fear of disappointing others <laughs> that I've been rooting for you is is significant. So, right. 
so far. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, after, after graduation, went off to flight school. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I finished, um, uh, IFS. So it's introductory flight screener. Uh, the whole program's kind of been revamped from this point sure. forward. So I'm kind of talking about old history here, but yeah. uh, it was IFS where you get to learn how to fly a, a Cessna, um, and, and you kind of get your, your, you're in into the aviation world. I had already been pretty good flying. So that was a, that was a breeze for me. But then when you go off to, uh, what's called API or at the time it was API and, uh, gosh, I can't remember the, what the acronym is, but essentially it's, it's four weeks of just getting piles of knowledge rammed mm. down your throat. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't keep up with it. And I, I had sat down with, um, the CEO of the schoolhouse. And he said, look, if, if you can't get through this, you're never going to get through primary or advanced school. And honestly, it worked out. I mean, it worked out. I, I went through a, a, uh, rescreening board, um, and, uh, reselected supply officer. So I went into the supply core out of there and, uh, really what I tell people is it, it worked out for me. It, yeah. I'm kind of bummed out, you know, I can't be Maverick or something or fly <laughs> aircraft, but I, I have come to discover that Supply Corps is just one of those phenomenal communities mm. um, that really just keeps everything going, right? It's the behind the scenes, uh, logistics and and helping out the fleet and even the, the military in general, right? We, we have yeah. our hands in just about every, um, everything. Yeah. So, so. B- before we get too far into, into, you know, that part of your career. So just to clarify, it was it was the academic portion that that washed you out of flight school, which which is seems like a common, you know, theme as as I was kind of pursuing it. And I remember talking to some pilot on the hiring board. He's like, we can meet we can teach monkeys how to fly. You know, it's it's that's not the part that that's going to be difficult. And that's why they always look at GPA. They always look at like how you done as a student throughout your life, because, yeah, I mean, the academics are. No joke. <laughs> like it, it's, it's so much memorization. There's so much, you know, science and math to, to consider. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's just that, right? Like I, I, they call it stick and rudder skills. So like my stick mm-hmm. and rudder skills are, are great. I, yeah. I feel like I, I can land a plane and, you know, 30 knots of crosswind and it's great. However, yeah. if there's a, like a really bad problem or there's something that I need to know about something else, mm-hmm. um, that knowledge wasn't particularly there. So like part of API when you're going through the academic portion is, I mean, you're learning uh, aeronautics 101 in a week. I mean, you're learning everything about how an airplane flies, how a helicopter flies, uh, characteristics. And then, and then you hop over to the next week and you're learning about weather and aeronautics Mm -hmm. too. So advanced level aeronautics. And then, Next week in that, you're learning about thermodynamics. So how does an yeah. engine work and all that? So, so of course, if if you're not really prepared for that, you're just going to get crushed. Totally. Um, and then yeah. when you go off to when you go off to primary and actually fly the aircraft, mm-hmm. um, you, you got to learn emergency procedures. You got to learn how everything works. You got to learn how to talk and fly forums. And so again, if if you're not particularly wired up to absorb that and process that in in a timely fashion yeah uh you can get swapped and that's totally. kind of what happened with me yeah yeah and especially if you know at the beginning when they're kind of like withholding the actual flying from you and just like you know abusing you with all this academic work you're like wait a second i thought i was in flight school what the heck is what the heck is this <laughs> you know yeah yeah and you got you gotta yeah. make it through that process just to be able to to fly you know so yeah it's significant what you know, take us through what that was like for you when you like got word that this was, you know, you weren't going to make it. And this, this was the end of the road for you. Uh, there were dark times, right? right? They were dark, dark times. Um, uh, you know, uh, thankfully at, at the time I was married uh, to my wonderful wife and she helped me kind of get through that process. And at the time to my uh, grandfather that my yeah, was there. And so he kind of helped me through. Um, 
and it was it was tough uh, because kind of what happens is when you wash out of flight school, like I had a lot of my buddies uh, who were there, or even some of my roommates. And when I when I washed out, you almost got this vibe like we're still friends. We're still drinking mm-hmm. buddies and totally. all that. But you, there was this vibe where it was like you're no longer part of the club. Totally. Yeah. And that added to that that level of. uh desperate yeah uh it, like darkness Iso- to it, right? isolation like yeah, yeah isolation yeah. so you know it, and it was also one of those things where part of that poker process like redesignating it was at the time that i went through it was 80 percent attrition mm. so you applied and only two out of ten folks applying got redesignated into another computer community and the other eight got kicked out like hey thank you oh, for your shoot. service yeah and Just so kicked i was out of the looking, military kicked out of the oh, military wow. now granted the way the process works is uh when they do let you go so i i at first i was really afraid like if i got kicked out i gotta owe what amounts to like three hundred thousand dollars to the naval academy because that's what it costs oh. right so if, if you get they kicked would, out they would naval- bill you for that no yeah so oh my so if goodness you, that's so the way it works <laughs> right. And so I was, de- you know, here's one I'm looking at, I'm looking down the barrel of getting kicked out of the military with yeah. no skills or any ambition. Like, I don't even know what job I would have gone for. Um, and, uh, and then also possible payback. However, if, you know, if you do get kicked out and they tell you, Hey, the communities you applied to, um, are just not accepting, we are letting you go. It's like you're waived of all your sins. And it's like, thank you enjoy, have fun. Um, and, and so I guess some folks kind of look at that as a, as a blessing because mm-hmm. they can get out of the Navy and not really owe anything. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's, it scared the crap out of me. Right. Cause I, I did not want to leave. I didn't yeah. want to leave the Navy. Um, I didn't want that to happen to me. So I, I wanted to stay in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so going through that process at that time, uh, was very depressing. Uh, it was, it was tough. It was a tough, uh, six months. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. I, I didn't realize, I mean, that's a multifaceted issue where it's like, yeah, you're heartbroken because you're not going to be flying, but now you're on the risk of a massive like debt, you know, that it's uncle Sam coming for that debt, which a lot of people don't realize. Like sometimes <laughs> like the military will, you get pretty freaking screwed with some, <laughs> some debt letters that like you don't expect or you didn't realize was in the fine print, you know, on those kind right. of opportunities. And, you know, like right. th- all of a sudden you're paying, you know, you got a debt of 300 K for your college education that you thought was free. <laughs> Brutal. 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 <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. That's intense. Okay. So yeah, obviously, you know, quite a, quite an event there that you had to go through and, um, I mean, so you ultimately put in for supply or like you, they gave you three options and you're like, here's my first, second and third. Like, how did that play out? Yeah. So when you apply, you, you I think you have up to five um, options, four or five options. And so I applied for supply core first and that surface warfare officer second because I figured I, I knew how to how to run the game on ships. Uh, however, I had zero ambition to drive ships. Um, they're a lot of fun, but not particularly my cup of tea. Right. Um, and then I, I think I applied for, um, like IP and, and something else like I, I S right. So, it, um, information specialist, uh, it's, it's like surveillance kind of guys. However, mm-hmm. at the time, at the time it was called information dominance, uh, that whole community. And, uh, when I called them up, they laughed at me cause it was like, do you know, you don't have a, computer science background. Mm. Yeah, sure. You're an IT, but anyone could be an IT. Right. And so I I really only had two options, um, to get selected into either supply core or a surface warfare officer. Okay. Okay. And, and so where are you in your career at this point? So you, you enlisted and at what year three, you went to the academy or how far in were you when you went to the academy? So, so by year three, I got, um, I, I got picked up okay. and went off to the Academy at that time. Your, your active duty clock stops. 
Um, so the moment you yes. raise your right hand, so like technically on paper, I'm coming up on 17 years uh, this September. Um, however, the moment you raise your right hand on I, your clock stops. No You're kidding. still active duty. It doesn't count towards anything. Um, and so on paper, I have 12 years, uh, but in actuality, I have 16. Wait a second. Um, so, so for somebody that does MESEP, like enlisted, uh, I don't even remember what it stands for. Oh, this is Marine Corps specific acronym where they're just go, they're going to a traditional college and they're signing, they're basically signing their commission paperwork, I believe, like before they actually start. Or not commission paperwork, but commitment to where then they go to college for four years and they go to OCS, I think, between junior and senior year. Those people, their time in college counts towards retirement on active duty. Right. Uh, the academy is the anomaly. Right. Unbelievable. So Unbelievable. Yeah. Shocking. Folks, folks who do like ROTC. Right. So that's why that's why things like uh, Seaman Admiral 21, State 21 and ROTC. Um, however, when I. I might be a little wrong here, but I'm when you're enlisted, you can't particularly apply for ROTC while you're in. And I, yeah. cause you're just not part of that. So you have to get your degree and then apply for OCS. So offer officer candidate school, right. Yeah. Or you can apply for a program called state 21. The problem with both of those programs, and I explained this to all the sailors, right? So if you think of those commissioning programs as a, as a op, like a window, so state 21 is out to here. Because anyone can apply, anyone from an E1 to an E E7 can apply, and, but this is your competitive range, and and then as you go to OCS, the competitive range gets closer mm-hmm. because the only the only way you could do OCS is get a college degree, and then you can apply, and, and that's why the academy is like the academy is like this mm-hmm. because you have to be like less than twenty three years old, you yeah. can't be married, you can't have crushing debt, yeah. and you got to have a performance score, so. So that's why uh, they have, you know, that's why it's such a great program, but uh, sidetracking there. uh, Yeah. So while you go through OCS um, and even state 21, you're still building active duty time. But when you go out to the Academy clock stops, brutal. Oh yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's worth it. You know, it's like, I could go to like university of state, whatever, who cares still become a pilot. And that whole four years where I'm like chilling and go to college, like counts. You know, like that, I don't know. I, Academy's like cool and all, but that's, that's four years. It doesn't count. That kind of sucks. <laughs> well, that, that's precisely why a lot of people called me. A lot yeah. of my buddies when I was, I was in, uh, as enlisted, were just like, you're crazy, man. Like, why would you do this? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, people were kind of giving you a hard time saying that the Academy's like a, a bad route, like strategically, as far as career goes time-wise, you know? Right. Right. But that's, that's part of that hidden package, right? It's mm. people just look at it at face value. Like, Hey, you got to go up to four years. It's not the real college college experience. Yeah. Um, you're told what to do day in, day out. You're, you're getting a degree. I mean, a bachelor's of science is no joke. Okay. So everyone who goes there gets a bachelor's of science with a uh, major in history, aeronautics, uh, econ, you know, what have you, but, the core of it is, I mean, the bachelor of science is, is pretty brutal, right? Yeah. Cause you're getting, um, and I say brutal from my aspect of being kind of a dummy in school. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're getting, um, chemistry, physics. Yeah. You're uh, not, you're not going there to get a basket weaving degree, you know, even, even their most basket weaving esque degree is like a real college program. You're still being challenged. Whereas, yeah. whereas when people go off to, you know, when people are active duty, getting their college degree, you know, night classes or online classes, I mean, you can get anything, right? You can get in marketing and bachelor's of arts in marketing or, yeah. or, or a bachelor's of, you know, yeah. business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it's, it's less stringent when you do it yourself and then apply to OCS. And even when you apply for state 21, I mean, you don't have to have real really any college background. I mean, they prefer that you have at least a year or two yeah. um, be- because it is a condensed um, program. Um, so you, you generally have to get your bachelor's in three years as opposed to four. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
while you're going through on state 21, you're making E5 pay and you're getting BH and yeah. I mean, you're going to school. Uh, and I, I think you have to drill like once a month or something. So of course you could see where to a, a sale, to a, to an enlisted member, those programs are way more appealing than going to the Academy and being told totally. what to do for four years and being locked down and, yeah. and just getting your face kicked in uh, academically. Yeah. Um, but, Oh, no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. What I was going to say, I mean, part of that, uh, like, hidden benefit, if you will, is, I mean, the, the camaraderie I have, like, I, I'm terrible about keeping up with people, but yeah, yeah. I have, I recently, I've made a lot of phone calls to people I haven't chatted with in, in, you know, six to eight years, yeah. and we just hit it off because we have that camaraderie, right? We, we spent four years uh, going through that process. And then, of course, you get out with Again, what amounts to a three hundred thousand dollar education? I mean, I'm sure at today's rate, the mm -hmm. the education is even more than that. And you get yeah. a lot of cool summer programs. You know, I got to fly in in airplanes. I got to go in a sub. I got to play in the field yeah. with Marines shooting guns and grenade launchers. I mean, you get to do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, but the cost is that oddity that's not part of of the stereotypical college experience. Sure. Which I, don't know, I think, you know, too many young people focus on that too yeah. much. And it's like, it only diverts you anyways. It only like, like it, I don't, I don't see any upside to the traditional college experience. Now people can call it fun, but you can really screw yourself over. You can spend way too much money. You can get in trouble. Like it just, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't, it never seemed that appealing to me, thankfully. Um, Right. And I think it's somehow, yeah, it's somehow like put on some pedestal that you should go experience this, but you know. Right. And from a, and from a business aspect, like it, it just college right now, if you cut out the military component mm -hmm. of it, right. It like going from high school to college without any scholarships and racking up hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. I mean, that is total scam. to me, that's total scam, yeah. like yeah. total lunacy. Right. Because I mean, I mean, you're, you're in real estate investing. I'm touching the the surface of that. I mean, imagine all the money. Like when I think about it, like, you know, my, my wife carried college debt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was close to $50,000. I mean, $50,000 wow. could have been a down payment on an investment property. Totally. Looking back on it, right? Like, sure. It's, I mean, knowing what I know now, like, and how many ways there are to go to school for free. It's like the fact that yeah. people pay sticker price. Not only like pay sticker price in their own state, they'll go to another state and pay that higher sticker price. Like they are just totally being sold to the freaking Lululemons and the Gucci and all this other crap that literally means nothing, you know? And there's like, maybe there's like the top five schools that like would actually, you know, their alumni networks have an actual impact. But beyond that, dude, like, oh gosh, it's, it, it's, I can't, like in 2022, people are still doing this. People are still paying for it. And like the parents are still pushing it. And I'm just like, I mean, it's, 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 it's insane. I mean, and again, like knowing what I know now, and I look at it, I look at everything in numbers and percentages. Right. And and yeah. when you look at college from a, from a cookie cutter standpoint of going and paying sticker price at a, mm -hmm. a major institution, getting a degree in something that's not going to pay out. I mean, the ROI on college mm -hmm. is deep in the negative. Yeah, right? for I most mean, people, yes, that's very true. For yeah. most people, right? Uh, yeah. Of course, there's there's outliers who go and and uh, and and get degrees and become off, yeah, doctors, lawyers, computer engineers. Like that's sure. fine. Yeah. Like that makes that makes sense because you're using college as a stepping stone. But going to college because somebody told you to go to college, mm -hmm. and it's part of that. Well, I want that experience. I want to go off to yeah. Candyland and go have that experience and then come out with crushing debt. Like that's just. Yeah. Silly to me. And, that, and that's where the military is a phenomenal uh, experience in totally. that regard. Totally. And that, that begs the question. So I know different programs will have a different impact on your GI Bill. Did you go into the academy, essentially use your GI Bill, or do you still have a GI Bill for later on? So I still have the GI Bill for uh, for later on. However, okay. that that college kicker that I mentioned earlier uh, it vaporized, oh, right? Really? It vaporized. It, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't get to touch that. That was part of my enlisted contract and, 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 and 
technically I didn't fulfill that contract, right? Mm -hmm. You get waived. Like I got my D214 as an enlisted member. Um, But again, the moment you, moment you raise that right hand on I day, your first day of the Academy, um, the enlisted experience, it just goes away. Like it just stops, like the clock stops. And, you know, uh, about a year or two later, I I signed my 214 when I did, uh, we call it the two for seven, right? So you sign, you sign a contract that says, because your first two years at the academy, you can leave without any repercussions. Mm-hmm. So if if you're a if you're a if you're enlisted and you go to the academy and you quit during your sophomore uh, freshman or sophomore year, you return back to active duty service. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're a high schooler, you leave and they're like, "Thank you, hope you had fun, enjoy life." Right? But after your sophomore year, going into your junior year. Uh, when you sign the contract, that's we call it the two for seven, right? You're signing on for an additional two years for a total of seven years, five year commitment after graduation. If you leave at that point, you're you're on the hook. Yeah. It's prorated. So so every day that you keep going, mm. you pay back. Um, Even for the freshman and sophomore years that you wouldn't have had to pay back if you left. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, so no, I, no. I actually <laughs> I actually know of a couple of folks who um they had, uh, you know, honor offenses, right? They cheated on a test. Oh, shoot. Um, didn't get, didn't do well in the rehabilitation process, like the honor rehabilitation process and got kicked out like a couple months prior to graduation. And I mean, they were handed a bill for $350,000, oh, which you could pay back out of pocket or you could pay back in terms of service. And so there's folks who, you know, you can't, you can't make it. And by the way, it's not, it's not like a mortgage, right? Where you got to pay $350,000 over the course of 30 years. It's like, it's like five or 10 years. I oh, mean, you wow. owe it back big time. Wow. Um, so even if, even somebody who, you know, integrity violation, which is a massive thing, you know, they let these people go enlisted and pay it back that way. Is that what you're saying? Interesting. And so they, is, they're still E1, you know, they still get paid, but each year counts for, X number of dollars or something like that. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, it's all part of the, 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 what you come in as and the, and the, the agreement, it's just like you, you work with a recruiter, just like anything else. Um, So folks who have college degrees or working towards college can normally come in as like an E3, right? So I know for the Navy, if you have a college degree, you can, and you you want to enlist, you can come in as like an E3. Um, sometimes depending on the rate, you can come in as an E4. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so. Man. Yeah. That'd be hard. Yeah. That'd be hard to stomach. It's, it was pretty wild to see. Yeah. Um, which again is, is yet another motivator for, you know, when I was getting on that tail end, uh, that, that was another push, right? Mm-hmm. Not disappointing people, but also not being financially reliable yeah, or responsible, if you will. Um, for that bill. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it makes sense. I'm not like saying like a big, big, bad, you know, mean academy. Like, you know, it, it doesn't, <laughs> there's no reason why somebody should be able to get away with cheating in the ninth inning and then like getting their commission or like not having to pay it back. It's like, as a taxpayer, like, I don't really want to pay for you to, you know, screw things up like that. So there should be consequences. But if you're the yeah. one that gets slammed with the consequences, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. It's it's certainly a motivator, right? To to be yeah. clean, clean cut all the way through, um, yeah. and yeah. also just don't have those those issues. Yeah. That Navy's yeah. got to get their their money back. Totally. So it's either in time or financial. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So how are you feeling about your career nowadays? I mean, you're twelve or seventeen years in, kind of thing, and I assume you're taking it all the way to the last, you know, retirement period and. Yeah. So, okay. you know, like I said, on paper, um, um, I'm at 12 years um, and uh, I'm, I'm getting my master's right now. So I'm, I'm currently in Naval Postgraduate School, um, cool. getting my master's, my my MBA in contract and acquisition. So the supply nice. core has been, uh, you know, very good to me. Um, I've had a great career so far. Um, and part of part of our pipeline is you get a higher education uh, graduate level uh, education so that you can carry that into further like staff level jobs and provide um, kind of that business aspect. So 
I'm sure it's the same for a lot of other services, but when you're when you're kind of going from O one to O three, you're working operational roles. You're, mm-hmm. you're very just in the in the weeds, nitty gritty operational roles. And then when you finally make O four, um, that's where they want you to be kind of specialized and provide that top level cover yeah. knowledge. Sure. And, and so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so I'm just learning how to apply business to the military trying to get smarter that way when i go and work a staff job i i can provide contract and equity acquisition knowledge nice. and hopefully i've do, hopefully i've done with ships uh i've, <laughs> I've served on three ships uh, i'm kind of i'm kind of done with that yeah uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun but it's time away from the family is is real tough i mean yeah just 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 like a deployment in, into uh you know, theater, it's no one likes being gone from the family. No one likes being gone from their, their quality of life and what they're doing, their hobbies. Uh, so I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of glad that I don't have to go to a ship anytime soon. Yeah, that's fair. I don't, I don't blame you. I never, I never did ship time in the Marine Corps. And, uh, for a while I was like kind of bummed about it, you know, like while you're in, you get excited about silly things. <laughs> and, but now yeah. like, you know, when, when I hear people's stories, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like it just sounds miserable. So everything happens for a reason. I'm, I'm pretty grateful for how things worked out, but yeah. So, but kind of going back to your question, I, I, I think at this point, um, I, I've, I feel like I've kind of achieved everything I need to achieve out of the Navy. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it, in terms of the requirements, I have essentially eight more years left and then I can retire. And, and a lot of people say this phrase where you'd be, you know, once you hit the halfway mark, you'd be done to leave, right? Because I'm kind of on glide slope now to retire um, and get the get the pension, get the benefits. And also, I, I kind of haven't really figured out what I would do on the outside. That, yeah. Um, and so until I, so now I'm I'm kind of reshaping uh, the optics from okay, I got to keep my head down and just do really well and, and get through the 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 path. And now I'm at this point where. I could see the light and I'm like, okay, I need to start thinking about yeah. the eight years from now, if I decide to transition out, have I aligned myself well enough? Like, can I use the tools in my toolbox mm-hmm. and the experience I have to be successful on the outside? Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, like eight years is an awesome runway. And uh, so good for you for like starting to think about it now. Cause a lot of people are like, I got a four year contract. All right. At three years and six months, I'll start thinking about it. And then like, and you know, those three years and six months, they've racked up a bunch of debt. They've like dug themselves in some pretty big holes and it takes a couple of years to dig themselves out of a hole, you know? So, right. so, you know, I think uh, eight years is like a, an awesome amount of time to be like, to build, you know, not only a, build on the foundation that you've already been building. Um, so that's super awesome Good for you, man. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, and, and the other thing too, and a lot of the reason why the military is great is, uh, I have a guaranteed paycheck yeah. at least for the next eight years, right? Whereas if I was working in corporate America, I mean, you never know when you're going to get your your notice, mm-hmm. right? So you could plan out your life and you could plan out everything else. Like, but as long as I don't break my back or do anything questionable or unethical or mm-hmm. immoral, yeah, um, you're good. I, I'm I'm good, yeah. and so. <laughs> using that time now to think about the end. Um, yeah, it's yeah. good. As opposed to the, the six months prior to leaving and you're like, Oh crap. Like, what do I do? Yeah. You know, <laughs> unfortunately it's all, it's all too common. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately it is. Fortunately I, I, it is. I want to give you a sec to see, you know, see if something comes to mind. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to share a story of like craziest thing, you know, in your Navy career, funniest thing. Like what's a, just what's a memory that comes to mind that you want to kind of share a story? Oh man, you got me. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's usually not for lack of, <laughs> it's usually like, man, of all the stories, which one do I, do I share? But You, you know, I think, I think the one that, uh, the one that just kind of pops in my mind and going back to ships, right? So I think the most, uh, it was one of the most exciting, but also the scariest uh, I've ever felt uh, being on a ship uh, um, was when I was, it was um, in 2015, 
I was on a destroyer, so Arleigh Burke destroyer, um, and I was based up in Everett, Washington. And part of being up in Washington, beautiful state, yeah. But there's no services, right? No services for the uh, small ship fleet, right? Mm. And so, in order to get work done, you have to go down to San Diego. That's where you do all the training. So you you take a, a week to go down to San Diego, and you spend a week, or uh, it takes a week to get down there. And then once you get down there, you're doing all the training, you're doing all the workups for deployment because we're gearing up to go into the uh, South China Sea and mm-hmm. the Pacific for uh, deployment in 16. Well, go down there, get trained up, get some maintenance done. And it's it's close to it's uh, Thanksgiving of 2015. Okay. And we are trying to hightail it back to get back for Thanksgiving. Mm. And the crew told the captain, hey, we're, we got to go. We don't care. And and he's like telling everybody, hey, there's this massive storm off the coast of Oregon. So anyone who knows uh, that area, that area is always in turbulence. I mean, yeah. that area is always just wild. And I mean, we were looking at we were looking at like 30 to 35 foot waves. Um, and so we we were like, nope, let's do it. We'll, we'll handle it. And we were going back up. We were just going as fast as we could. And the, the seas for at least like two days were hitting us directly on the beam. So mm. it, completely perpendicular, right? So if this is the ship, the waves were hitting us perfectly on the beam. Um, and we were seeing something like 26 degree rolls. So that's like being on a roller coaster, right? That's like that's like the, the pitch of a roller coaster when you're when you're dropping. And we are taking these massive rolls. Everybody on the ship was like, oh my God, we're gonna capsize, you know, the the, <laughs> the limitations, you know, it's called the 26, 26, 26 rule, where you know you can only go through 20. And Arleigh Burke destroyers were built for this, right? Yeah, yeah. But they're built to go through the waves, not to take take them on the side. So mm. if you ever watch videos, the the ships will go through waves and it just like the whole the whole bow will get surrounded by, you know, just engulfed in in a wave. And so we're just taking these hits. And I mean, you can't even walk in the P waves. You're walking on the bulkheads, which is the walls for non-navy guys. Right. So you're just walking down and you're just like thrown into pipes and clock in your head. And we're just getting, I mean, no one can eat. Like you can't eat because like nothing would stay on the table, even with all the, the sticky matting and stuff. And at one moment we just took this, I was sleeping at night. It's like two o'clock in the morning. And uh, I, you could just hear it and feel it where we got hit with a wave and we were rolling. And as we were rolling, we got hit with another wave. And thankfully I was on the bottom part of my rack and like an idiot, I didn't put up the hurricane straps. You have hurricane straps mm-hmm. that kind of keep you inside. Mm-hmm. And I was in my, my sleeping bag and man, I got ejected from my rack. I got like chucked out of my rack and I slid across the state room. I had chairs and shit falling all over me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna die out here. Like, I'm we're gonna die out here because this is just the the worst seas I've ever seen. You know, there's. I mean, I'm no um, like I'm no like professional sailor, but usually if there's waves like that, you you go right into them. So I mean, is, is the captain just like, hey, we gotta make it back for Thanksgiving? And obviously, if we go right into them, we're going uh, taking a detour. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. what's the thought well, process? That's. That's part of the problem, right? So the the seas were coming from, a, a, you know, in, in simple terms, west to east, right? Yeah. So they were they're coming from west to east, and we had to go south to north. Yeah. And there's no way to, you know, you can't drive into the waves going east because now you're wasting time going a direction you shouldn't be going. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, uh, God bless the captain. Like I, I know he's probably he had probably sweaty palms during that time. <laughs> Um, and, and the crew asked for it. I mean, we all, we all agreed to do it because yeah. otherwise we would have been a, a week late while the storm subsided. And how, how many people are on a boat a, like that? Uh, roughly 300. 300. That's, okay. that's kind of the, the good roundup number. I mean, obviously yeah. it's plus or minus 40 sure. or 50, um, but 300 on a destroyer, uh, and it's destroyers are about 500 some odd feet long. So it's, it's tight living, right? I mean, yeah. it's tight living. Um, and it's certainly pretty gross too, and uh, you're kind of 
trapped in a room, um, you know, like the combat information center, right? The little central part. So anyone who's ever watched Battleship, which is not a good, great representation of the Navy, by the way, um, you know, the room with all the blue lights and the, the screens, uh, nothing's worse than trying to sit in there uh, and people are just puking in buckets or bags all around you and you're trying to keep it together. Oh. Same thing goes up on the bridge when you're trying to drive the ship. Um, yeah. You know, that's happened to me a couple of times. You know, I'm just driving the ship and I'm just like, oh boy. And you go out into the bridge wing, you know, go outside and, mm-hmm. you know, just let it all go. I and imagine, it back in and drink. Were you even allowed out? You know, kind of, I imagine nobody was allowed outside during this time. Oh, no. Like you, you'd get thrown overboard pretty easily. <laughs> oh, you'd be chucked overboard. Yeah, yeah. No, no one, no one. There's a lot of, generally in, in cases like that, they secure the weather decks, you know, they, yeah. they make sure that no one goes outside. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah because yeah you would absolutely be yeah god i mean you'd be and 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 the thing in that those environments too like if you happen to fall overboard i mean you're host there's mm-hmm. there's no way that you're yeah. i mean it, eventually you'd get recovered but man it'd just yeah. be be brutal yeah yeah I, my wife and i just watched this uh movie true true spirit it's about the this girl australian girl 16 years old who sailed around the world by herself. And I'm like, you oh, know, yeah. it's, it's a movie. It's, you know, they, it's movie ties, but, uh, I mean, forget it, dude. In like a small, like probably a 30 foot sailboat. I'm like, dude, forget, forget it. it. Forget <laughs> it. Not my forget thing. It. You can have it 16 year old, like good for you. But yeah, I mean, no. even, even being a destroyer, I mean, like the ocean's a beast. It's so. a beast. Yeah. It's a beast. And it's, it's scary out there. I mean, sometimes it's like, Sometimes, you know, it's overcast and it's dark. And mm. I mean, you look out the window and you can't see anything. I mean, there's yeah. nothing out there. Yeah. And if you fell in and you didn't have a light or anything on you, I mean. Yeah. Toast. Bye. That's right. it. You're toast. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. No, I appreciate you sharing that story, man. That's good. All right. Well, we'll, we'll wrap it up with some, uh, some closing questions and let you enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Um, yeah. So at this point, doing everything you've done in the military, would you recommend the military to somebody else? I would. You would. I think the only reason why I hesitate with that is uh, I I will admit, and I'll probably get some heat for this, but I yeah. will say COVID didn't do the military any favors. Mm. COVID didn't do right? anybody any favors. <laughs> COVID didn't do anyone favors. Uh, yeah. COVID in the military was especially hard. Yeah. I, bet. Uh, a lo- I know of a lot of folks who left during that time because it was just arduous. Um, a lot of stuff didn't make sense. Um, and I, am sure this applies to the commercial world too, but, um, that aside, yes, I think the military is a tremendous opportunity to really better yourself. If, yeah. if you have no idea what you want to do and you have no idea what, and, and, and you could admit that you're a little immature, mm-hmm. you join the military and you're going to get, you're going to get something out of it, either yeah. whether that's discipline, work ethic, habits, all the above. Yeah. Um, you're going to build camaraderie. Um, I think a lot of people can agree that if you stay in the Navy or the military long enough, the bonds you make with the people within your unit or within the service is like uncomparable to the commercial world. Yeah, You know, a lot of people are like, I'm going to leave the military, go work in corporate America. And, and and continue to do what I'm doing right now, mm-hmm. and and I think a lot of people just get that that harsh wake up call that hey that's not how that works yeah um, and so I think that's good too and then obviously with us talking about all the programs and the and the benefits I mean Americans love veterans you know yeah. so when you go to when you go to stores uh, and even when you go interact with folks like there's tons of veteran benefits not that I'm saying you join the the military to to get benefits yeah but it's sure. part of, yeah it's part of the deal it's, it's part of the deal yeah yeah and so yeah i i resounding i i i recommend the military if, whenever i talk to the young kids or yeah. or anyone who's uncertain I, I always pitch like hey did you consider this yeah especially when they're think that the better option is to go one hundred thousand dollars in debt for college <sighs> Yeah. And then they're like, I don't know what I want to study. I'll probably just do like psychology or something. And it's like, okay, yeah. dude. <laughs> ah, it just so, breaks my heart. It yeah. breaks my heart. Seriously. Uh, next question. What do you think separates those who are successful in the military from those who aren't? 
uh, kind of going back to that, that work ethic, um, yeah. even though, uh, I mean, there's always outliers, right? There's, there's the folks who don't really maximize the opportunities they have in the military. Um, but I, I think if you come in with the military with a good mindset and a good heart and like good motivation, yeah. um, your the the habits you build and the 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 discipline that you build uh, is something that you're you're not really going to be able to create in the outside world by yourself. Like you're kind of pushed. Like the the way the system set up pushes you to become that kind of person while you're in the service. Um, and I think that kind of that kind of I mean that's a lot of the reason why. Um, when you look at jobs, hiring veterans, like people want veterans because they know like, Hey, you, you have the responsibility nine times out of 10, you're going to wake up to your alarm clock and show up on time or yeah. early. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that you have motivation and drive because you, you join the service and you like for 12 hours out of the day, you're just giving it your all. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, that usually people don't do that. Yeah. Because there's there's motivation to give it your all because you're looking out for your buddy, your you know the 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 wellness of the ship, the wellness of your unit, the air wing, the yeah. your airplane that you're about to fly. Like that translates really well. Um, whereas a civilian, you know, working nine to five, they they may not come of that motivation. Yeah. They'd have to like be mindful to do that on their own. They're not pushed into that. Totally, totally. Yeah, I know a lot of employers who. You know, obviously it depends on the industry, but it's, it's difficult to find good employees. And so if you can find somebody like a veteran that's willing to show up on time and put in the work for the day, yeah, that's a good employee, you know? So bonus. Uh, yeah. Bonus. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, man, <laughs> uh, Bill, I, I really appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you spending some time here on your Saturday and sharing your story. And I'm, I'm excited that, you know, despite, uh, the disappointment that is, you know, falling away from flying and not getting that opportunity, uh, it's heartbreaking. I feel your pain. And so I'm, I'm glad that you've, you found the, the goodness in that an opportunity to kind of move on to something else and, and you're happy where you are. So. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate this, Jason. This has been a, a lot of fun. Good chatting with you. Uh, I know my story is all over the place and hopefully people have <laughs> could follow along on this scenic route that I've taken, but, uh, no, this has been great. And hopefully somebody gets uh, something out of it and maybe, uh, you know, a young, uh, young enlisted person watches this and gets inspired to apply it at the academy and, and, you know, reap the benefits of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if you got anything that you, you know, social, if you've got a platform or anything, but uh, you're welcome to plug wherever people can reach out to you. If you've got yeah, something. not related to the military at all, but I just over Christmas, I started a, a channel called Rando Fix. Uh, I, I, uh, I love tinkering with stuff and, and modifying things around the house. And so uh, I, I got only a couple videos up where I upgraded my, my kids um, like electric vehicles. Cool. Um, and so it's, it's really a slow process. As, as you know, YouTube is, it's a it's a tough world to get into and be successful at uh and it takes a ton of time uh but that's kind of my side hobby yeah a lot of time um but yeah i got a, i got that channel it's 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 growing um it's a channel i've had since 2006 and then i reinvigorate it over christmas and uh um yeah so if I'll people want to check it out yeah I'll, I'll link it in the bottom and then if somebody has a an academy question or something like that they'll comment on your kids video and <laughs> start a conversation they can, there <laughs> they can hit me up i i put up uh you know i recently opened up the dining out videos that we did uh, at the academy so every year you have a each class right. does their their dining out video and so it's like a cool. it's like a zeitgeist for the year and, and so i have those up um but uh yeah it's kind of a hodgepodge but yeah, yeah. that's the only thing i have on social um cool. but uh yeah if people want to check it out they can they can learn from that sounds great thanks so much bill see you next time thanks a lot jason